Very early on into like my reading journey, I got into these uh, human nature books, and it's a very popular topic actually amongst like nonfiction readers, serious nonfiction readers, like the Forty Eight Laws of hum Human Nature, or like the 48, 48 Laws of Power. These are like human nature books. Um, usually in the philosophy and psychology section, it's always discussions about human nature. Uh, so as a result of this topic being so popular, I came across a lot of books on these topics very early on, but except. The difference being is I tend to stick towards more towards more academic books rather than the popular books you would find in bookstores, uh, especially in the self-help section. Even in the philosophy section, you always get the same generic philosophy books. Everyone sells Frederick Nietzsche, Aristotle, uh, Plato, uh, Confucius. They sell you all the same popular philosophers that I guess 18-year-olds and 20-year-olds love to discover. I don't blame them. I mean, got to make money selling books somehow. But uh, as a result, I've come across a lot of cool books on human nature that I want to share with you guys. The first one is Man and His Symbols. Now, this book actually isn't necessarily a human nature book, but uh, it does have a theory of human nature in here, and it's more of a metaphysical one. It's not a psychological one in the sense of like empirical psychology. I guess you could say it's psychological in, its, like, in the sense that it's like a, a philosophy about what a human is. But it's more of like metaphysics of the mind, I would say, more of like philosophy of mind. The idea, anyways, in Carl Jung is that the unconscious is an organism uh, that evolves over time, and that the symbols that we um, have in our society uh, derive their meaning from a relationship between the unconscious and the, the material world. So the material world being like the perception, the phenomenology we have, and the unconscious being the noumena that Kant calls it, or like what comes before consciousness, and that there's an organism in there that basically passes along symbols uh, and concepts and uh, has like archetypes or like schemas. Uh, there's these structures, <laughs> it's very vague language, uh, like the anima or the animus, that again, they have meaning baked into them and they interact with symbols in the world. So like, for example, the the cross. We have meaning associated with the cross because the unconscious has evolved over time to associate meaning with that. There's like a an inherent pair bonding there of, of some sort, or like the um, uh, the warrior archetype. Uh, the reason why we have this archetype is because it's baked into the unconscious, and then we unfold it into different symbols within the world, different cultures. That's what his view on uh, human nature is. That there is a conscious mind and an unconscious mind, and those two starting points kind of uh, characterize a lot of his psychology, like the process of individuation is for him making the unconscious and the conscious kind of mold together so they don't butt heads anymore. Uh, yeah, that's a fundamental view for human nature for Carl Jung. And it's a very interesting line because it's very unique and you're not going to see a lot of other books that kind of make this take. Another one is the marshmallow effect, or sorry, the marshmallow test. Um, so this book isn't necessarily about human nature in its all-encompassing approach, but it does have a lot to say about the nature of free will and uh, what you can do as a human being. It's more of an empirical psychology book, and the idea behind this book is that this uh, this will re willpower, whatever the key, he doesn't really clarify what it is like in an ontological sense, or like in its physical basis, but he does say that when we look at empirical measurements. Um, people who are using quote-unquote willpower tend to have a limitation on what they can do and it tends to be domain specific and uh, on top of that it's it can be modulated by environmental effects so when it's the, uh, when there's a limitation he means that like you can only do so much of it um, let's say you want the, the example is like if you resist eating two marshmallows I sorry if you resist eating one marshmallow you get two later uh, when you time people on this, uh, there tends to be a time limit where they decide they don't want to wait for the two marshmallows anymore. Uh, the same thing holds true for other, like uh, studying, um, great uh, performance outcomes in education, uh, performance outcomes in business or like uh, your, your career, people who tend to have an ability to delay gratification or like basically have this impulse control uh, tend to, to do better. But it is limited, and uh, the same thing holds true for like dieting. Um, your 
if we put you on a diet and we surround you by junk food, you're not going to be able to defer the impulse infinitely. At some point you will crack and you will eat junk food. So it's limited in the sense, right, that willpower. And then um, it's modulated by different kind of uh, environmental factors. So for example, if we put you in a support group, your willpower will go up. If we uh, give you coping techniques, such as like, rather than thinking about the marshmallows, we give you a task to do, uh, your willpower will go up. Uh, we have to give you different cognitive, like behavioral um, thinking methods or like coping, coping methods, like mental schemes to cope with it. Uh, your limitations will go up. So the idea that like there's a limitation to how much you can resist and that it, it, oh it's domain specific. So he gave the famous example of Bill Clinton being an Oxford Road scholar, which obviously demonstrates a lot of willpower and like the ability to defer impulse. But at the same time, he was not very good at deferring sexual impulses because he had a lot of sexual partners. So it's domain specific. This is an interesting take on like the nature of humans in this one particular domain that I think is really, really interesting because when you talk about free will and determinism, people always talk about it in the sense of um, does it exist or not? But what he's saying is this concept, free will, and when we use it to, de to denote willpower, it seems to be limited. He has more like empirical measurements about this stuff rather than metaphysical claims, which I think is interesting. Now, another interesting image for... Um, human nature is Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in this book that goes beyond just the, the simple concept of Leviathan. But I would say that the, the Levi Leviathan idea is a very interesting idea. It's also not so much uh, limited to just humans, it's also extending a little bit to society. But the idea is that humans are unregulated when there's no um, Leviathan or third party present who can punish both other parties involved. So think of, um, I don't know, think of like two small satellite states in Europe having a conflict with one another and then you can have Germany come in and say I'll punish both of you if you guys don't stop. Uh, kind of brings their behavior into control. If you think of two toddlers uh, threatening to fist fight each other, uh, an adult who is bigger and stronger can come in and threaten both parties by saying I'll put you both into like uh, punishment uh, if you do not uh, stop. Or if you think of police officers, police officers can come in and mitigate violence between two people by saying we'll send you both to jail. That's what the Leviathan concept is and that paints a very interesting picture about the nature of human beings uh, in general. That's why this book is on here. Another one is uh, Adam Smith. So this book is actually not about human nature, but it does have an interesting viewpoint on the nature of humans. Um, and that being the, the invisible hand effect. The idea that, I mean, also and that and self-interest. So like this book with the Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations will tell you that humans are self-interested and that they follow incentives. So if you want to get people to, for example, uh, Actually, let's go to another example. Let's say you wanted to make your society more transhumanist. You wouldn't do this by writing books about transhumanism or preaching transhumanism. Adam Smith would say you offer competitive advantages um, that would basically set up an incentive structure that makes people choose uh, the thing that you want. So let's say we have physical laborers who are competing against robots well if we offer these physical laborers robotic arms and robotic legs such that they can earn a lot more money then there's an incentive there to basically remove your biological arm and get a robotic arm and that that's uh, self-interest on the one hand following the incentive of self-interest and on the other hand it's a, an invisible hand in the sense that it guides society in a direction that is determined not by some person but by some incentive structure that is found in society. Now, Adam Smith thinks these incentive structures are mostly not centrally planned, but we do have some centrally planned incentive structures as well, such as excise taxes and stuff. So uh, that's what this book is about in the background. I think the, his human nature approach or theory is in the background is that stuff. The rest of the book is about how nations built their wealth through things like mercantilism. Now, another one is Social Contracts by Rousseau. Uh, this guy is basically the um, counter-arguer to Hobbes. Uh, he argues that humans should come together and form contracts, uh, not just formal ones, but informal ones, 
and that that will lead to a more productive and healthy society because humans can respect contracts. There are so many reasons why humans respect contracts. The best examples of like informal social contracts might be when you go to a library, you understand it's rude to be too loud or to do anything that's, um, I don't know, that would disturb someone else's studying. You don't want to do that. Uh, we tend to, for example, uh, if someone says hello to you, it's considered rude to not say hello back. This is another like informal social contract. Uh, don't, don't, if you find money, you should return it. Um, although some of these social contracts are also not super strong, and so therefore we also have legal contracts that are uh, more formal and that in enforce some of the stuff. And that's Rousseau's take on uh, society and therefore human nature, that we should be creatures of agreement. I think this is his the best way to sum up his philosophy. Now, another book on here is another Hobbes book, and I think this is the book that directly goes against Rousseau, uh, Human Nature and De Corporo Politico. Don't know if I said that correctly. Um, this book literally just says everybody is for themselves. That with uh, in, in a state of nature for humans is to everybody be going to war with one another. You don't want to cooperate with your partner or your neighbor. You want to steal their stuff. You want to take all of their stuff, okay? Uh, the only reason why you would ever cooperate with somebody is because you want to steal from somebody else. Like, it's that's the idea in here. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. But at the same time, there aren't a lot of books that are written like this, surprisingly. Um, the Lucifer Effect. So this one is more of a social psychology take on human nature. And the idea is that there are situations and contexts that control your behavior more so than you, the sense of internal control that you have. Uh, if you think you're consciously choosing everything in life, no. Uh, this book would argue that even things like good and evil are subject to contexts and conditions and power hierarchies, basically all these things outside of yourself. Because the, the idea behind this book is that he took ordinary university graduate students uh, actually, not even just graduate students, just ordinary people, I believe. I believe some of the people came from outside of a university setting and made them engage in uh, high levels of sadism, uh, basically deriving pleasure from harming other people. And he used this study to explain things like Avogadro prison uh, or Nazi Germany. He would say that, for example, that all of the people in Germany were evil people. They were simply subject to a social environment that led them to do evil things. Now, this book, uh, Beast and Man, The Roots of Human Nature, paints a very interesting image as well of human nature in the sense that <clears throat> she's not a greedy reductionist. In fact, I don't even think she's a reductionist. I'm pretty sure, like, the, I read this book years ago, but I remember her saying a lot of the time that uh, physiological explanations are not adequate to explain the conscious experiences of things involved. And as a result, she thinks that any theory of human nature uh, needs to take into context um, conscious experiences in addition to naturalist experiences. It's not that she was against it, it's that she thinks every level of analysis has its place and you can't go down a level of analysis to explain a more emergent level of analysis. You need to stick to the, the, the proper level. So I think she would argue, for example, that if you were going to explain human experiences, you wouldn't reduce to neuroscience um, because that's only going to explain neuroscience. You need to, if you want to explain conscious experiences, you need to stay at the level of conscious experiences. And a lot of this book goes basically over different evolutionary theories that try to explain human nature. And she kind of points out how they don't actually explain human nature. They just reduce human nature and that a genuine explanation would stay on the consciousness level. You may not agree with that, but it is an interesting approach to human nature. Now another one is uh, biology, uh, sorry, behave, <laughs> the biology of humans at our best and worst. This book is not specifically behavioral endocrinology, but because Sapowski is a behavioral endocrinologist, I've simply put this book here. Uh, the reason why it's here is because behavioral endocrinology is a very fascinating view of human nature. Uh, the idea is that um, Hormones have a, a significant role to play on your behaviors, and it's not that they determine the content of those behaviors, but it's that they modulate them. Uh, it's very interesting. So, like, 
if you think of like um, oxytocin, when we give oxytocin to people, it's like a love chemical, love hormone. Uh, when we give oxytocin to people and set them in a shopping environment, they're more likely to spend more money. Uh, if we ask people to donate and we give them oxytocin, they're more likely to uh, donate more money. Uh, and then when I say oxytocin, I think it's a nasal spray I'm talking about, that they spray in the nose. Um, if we uh, give uh, steroids to people, uh, it's not the case that they're going to be necessarily become more aggressive. It, it depends on whether there's a specific pathway in the orbital frontal cortex that uh, when a testosterone is introduced to this pathway, people can become more aggressive. But if that pathway is absent, then the higher levels of testosterone uh, won't make them more aggressive. Uh, so that's interesting. And the idea behind behavioral endocrinology is that hormones modulate behavior. They don't cause specific behaviors. If that makes sense. Now, another one is the adapted mind. This might be my favorite one. Uh, it's Evolutionary Psychology and the Generation of Culture. This book is a terrific book to actually understand what evolutionary psychology is. So many people do not understand evolutionary psychology. A lot of people actually are, are unwittingly sociobiologists. Sociobiology being the idea that behaviors maximize fitness, whereas um, evolutionary psychology does not make that argument. Evolutionary psychology has this idea that the brain is like a pocket knife and that there are different uh, physiological structures that have evolved uh, to, to make us more prone towards certain sets of behaviors, but not in specifics. So we have social neural networks in the brain that make us more social, and sometimes that results in us using Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, but other times that results in us gathering around a campfire and having uh, a very healthy community uh, developing at hand, okay? It's not the content of the behavior that is specific, or sorry, it's not the content of the behavior or the specific behavior that we've evolved for. That would be sociobiology arguing that. Evolutionary psychology argues that, again, we just have functions that make us more prone towards certain sets of behavior rather than others. And this book goes over lots and lots and lots of those um, functions. It talks about uh, memory differences between uh, males and females, um, social social behaviors that differ between humans and uh, primates. Uh, very interesting stuff. This book is great. It's also dense though. Now another one uh, that I'm actually currently reading is again not a book about um, human nature but it makes so many claims about human nature. It's Psychotherapy of Disorders of the Self, the Masterson's Approach. So basically this guy developed his own um, philosophy of therapy, his own framework, and uh, this one, he's looking at personality disorders. He has another book called The Real Self, where he talks about this, but it's maybe not empirically rigorous, but a very interesting uh, framework of analysis. The idea is that there is a self, then there is a, a uh, distortion of the self. So like there's a bottom layer, that's the real self. There's a distortion of the self, and then there is um, perceptions of objects. And basically, when there's a distortion of the self, uh, it filters all the perceptions that we have of objects that come back to us. So fundamentally it's like a object and a subject relationship and the subject can have a layer of distortion that interrupts their perceptions of objects. And he provides this framework or he uses this framework to analyze all the different personality disorders. So one of them was like narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder. He said that they tend to have a orientation towards non-reality, and this also distorts how they perceive objects. They don't have a realistic perception of objects. Uh, if you look at people who don't have um, empathy, he says, for example, that uh, they tend to have this perception of people as uh, objects with no subjective content to them. Um, so but, yeah, this is the idea. It's subject-object relationship with dis I guess, distortion filters that he calls personality disorders. It's very interesting uh, that he did this because most of the therapy books you'll read, nowadays at least, will tend to simply either talk about the therapeutic session itself or look at empirical studies without providing a, a framework to analyze the different uh, studies. And that's what 
makes this book great is, is that it provides that framework. Uh, another one is a bit of a popular one, but I put it, I was tempted not to put it on here. Like for example, David Hume's um, Treatise on Human Nature. I didn't want to put it in this list uh, because it's so common. But this one, <laughs> the only reason I put it on here is because the image it paints is very unique. Um, the idea behind this book comes from a, a movement in cognitive science called like heuristic cognition. And the idea behind here is to cognition is that humans aren't like these analytical uh, philosophy machines that use like predicate logic and do syllogistic reasoning. Uh, we don't even respond to empirical evidence super strong, uh, like in, in a super strong way. What we tend to do is we use heuristics, uh, and heuristics can also be stereotypes, I believe. Uh, and that informs a lot of our thinking. So rather than like, I don't know, applying predicate logic to a situation, we might instead say, well, if uh, like X is present, so like it's probably likely that Y is present, we won't actually go through any syllogistic reasoning. We'll just assume that if X is present, uh, Y is present. It's like a heuristic. Or um, again, stereotypes, we use stereotypes. So like uh, the famous one that's given in the literature is that um, all single males are bachelors. Uh, and if you apply the logical, like the absolute logical extent of that, that utterance, if you take it out to its logical extent, that entails gorillas, uh, g giraffes, things like this. These can be single males, but we wouldn't call them bachelors. Um, it's because humans have this prototypical category of what a single male is. When we use that heuristic to inform our judgments, it's not this rigorously logical thought out thing. That's the idea behind this book is that human nature is heuristic. It's like shortcut type of thinking. <laughs> now, another one that's really great is uh, IP Pavlov's Selected Works. And if you like psychology, please read this book. Pavlov is not a behaviorist. In this book, he trash talks behaviorism. He trash talks psychology. He says he would never call himself a psychologist. And he says the only useful thing that behaviorism has done is it has removed the language of philosophy, um, but it has not adopted the rigorous analysis that is associated with his conditioning experiments or a physiology. And this actually paints a much different uh, picture of Pavlov, but also his worldview that um, <laughs> it's almost like he ignores mental content. It's like the black box thing. He doesn't really talk about it at all. And he simply looks at uh, like a, 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 I guess you could like imagine it's like a, a kind of psychometric approach, but it's like reflex arcs. Yeah, I think he calls them like physiological arcs or something like this, where you give a stimulus or stimuli, and then you look at the, re the, the chain of physiological processes involved to producing an output that you think is um, beyond reasonable doubt associated with the stimuli. And that was very, that, that little point right there was very important for him because a lot of his dog experiments he did like hundreds of times. He made sure that no outside uh, noises entered the room. Uh, he made that no people were pre made sure no people were present. He was very much into the idea of controlling the experiment completely to actually kind of make this um, causal argument. But this general image of human nature that you get from him is that we're just input and output machines uh, that are very very complex that we don't understand, and he builds it up. Uh, into this grand image of human nature. A very unique take. Uh, you probably see this a lot in now modern physiological textbooks, but I think this one is worth reading because it's a primary source and he's a very misunderstood uh, thinker. Uh, Existential Psychotherapy by uh, Irvin Yalom. I thought his name was spelled with two O's. I always misspell his name. This is a great book because it talks about human nature. Uh, no, it talks about personhood and therefore human nature being shaped by fundamental questions or issues that were problems that humans have to face on a level of conscious experience. Uh, so for example, the, the, the meaning of life. Uh, if you cannot find a meaning of life, then you will go one way. If you can find a meaning of life, then you'll go another. It's like a forking event. It separates you into like this choosing. Um, dealing with death and the imminence of death. This is like another one. Uh, anxiety and oh, uh, responsibility, uh, adopting a certain level of responsibility and how you um, 
deal with the uh, the fact that you have to take responsibility inside society. These are like existential problems that you will face in life, and ha depending on what you do, they'll go one way or the other. And so you could say that his image of human nature is a bundle of fundamental problems that you'll face throughout your development um, that deal with your uh, existence and how you respond to these things will shape who you have become as a person. And that's a very interesting approach to human nature. So this one, uh, I was also tempted to not put subliminal how your conscious mind rules your behavior. Uh, <laughs> it basically, it's like you're on autopilot all the time. I was tempted not to put it because people read it so much, but the idea is you're on autopilot all the time and there's not much you can do to control that. Uh, it's kind of like epiphenomenalism in that sense. Um, the idea that your conscious mind has nothing to do with any of the behaviors you actually engage in. And he gave a lot of quirky little examples, like one was, I think, companies that had shorter names, even when they were comparable. So if you take a, a company that has a long name and a company that has a short name, and make sure that they're very comparable, uh, the companies on average that have shorter names will be um, companies that are worth more money, maybe their stock performs better, or maybe you like them more. Uh, the same thing goes with like, the famous experiment where if like, a cup has your name, um, you'll be more likely to buy it. Stuff like this, right? There's a bunch of behaviors that you have that you're just completely not in control of. Kind of basic, generic, by side, and whatever, I'll put it in. Uh, Conrad the Wrens uh, on Aggression. This is a very interesting book that even Sapowski recommends you read, uh, which is why I got it. And the idea in this book is very much antithetical to behavioral endocrinology. Behavioral endocrinology being the, the view that things are modulatory, uh, this Lorenz arguing that things are actually more like thresholds and there's like a very similarity here but not quite quite the same that there's a threshold that's reached and then once the threshold is reached things just overflow so he did this with aggression he said that if you look at um, geese I think his famous thing was with geese once they become a certain level of irritation their aggression overflows and they become very aggressive uh, the same thing was true for love. Once they've been sufficiently excited, then they will start to love. Uh, it, it becomes over, overflowing, and then like the, the the kind of the bucket will become depleted once it overflows and go back to a, a regular level. Uh, and it's determined by environmental factors. Whereas like a behavior endocrinologist will say that yes, environment plays a role, but hormone buildup can happen and it can just push a behavior on its own, independent of an external stimuli. Uh, so this book has more of like a threshold view. Actually, Lorenz in general has like a threshold view of human nature, which is also very interesting. Um, this book is not about human nature, but it makes claims about the nature of schizophrenia that would entail, therefore, that these things are present in humans. And the idea is actually a compatibilist view of determinism and free will. So in this book, he explains that a lot of the deficits that manifest in schizophrenia uh, as it progresses are deficits of free will, basically. That's like the only way you could put it. Um, they hear hallucinations that, or sorry, they hear auditory uh, stimuli that they believe is coming from outside of them, which it's not. Um, even when you put them in a sound controlled room, they will still hear the they will report hearing voices coming from the outside world. So it's internally produced, which means you lost this sense of it's yours, it's coming from you. That's what he's arguing, that it's actually there, that it's being produced inside them, but they've lost that sense of agency of being in control of it. Uh, they will experience thoughts that they think have been pushed into their head that are not theirs. Uh, there's just a ton and ton and a ton of symptoms that could be very easily explained by a lack of free will or the loss of a sense of free will, which gives you this compatibilist idea that maybe there is a neural mechanism responsible for that subjective experience of free will. But with, with schizophrenia, because there's such a global deterioration of the brain, like it basically, it's, yeah, it, the, the outside, I think it's the gray matter on the outside, I don't remember, I don't remember anymore, deteriorates globally, like the brain really just is getting less and less uh, dense over time. And perhaps while this is happening, this mechanism for free will is also being decayed. He thinks it's the frontal cortex, but uh, because I think the, the heaviest amount of deterioration in schizophrenia tends to happen in the frontal cortex. But that entails other things about human nature, that human nature is a compatibilist one, that um, 
is composed of a subjective sense of free will, but that free will is not libertarian free will. It's just a subjective sense. So there's, it's not an uncaused cause. Uh, and so you're determinist, you're, de you're determined in your behaviors, but you still have that physical existence, the like neural structure responsible for free will. And this is like an empirical way of establishing compatibilism as opposed to the traditional philosophical discussions you'll have. Now the last book I put on here is the Handbook of Diagnosis and Treatment of DSM Personality Disorders. The reason why this is on here is because I really like the idea of putting personalities into buckets and uh, it kind of functions as a heuristic for me even as well where you can look at people and you can say okay well on the one hand you can look at the big five traits uh, or some people like to do the <laughs> Myers-Briggs traits. Um, I agree Myers-Briggs isn't super scientific, but it's a useful tool nonetheless. Uh, you can do the Big Five, the Myers-Briggs, but then you can also do um, personality disorders, and you can classify people into these pre-constructed pre buckets and recognize that there's some variance, but they're almost like, like base points that you can tie someone coherently to one of these personality disorders or personality types, and then say, okay, maybe like their tether, their rope lets them kind of go maybe towards this personality structure a little bit more, but fundamentally they're in this one. And that's why this book is on here. Uh, it's just a personality book that teaches you about classifications and categorizations of human psychology. So those are some of the interesting books I've read on human nature. They're not all of the books. I knew this video was gonna be long to begin with, <laughs> but I figured some of you guys actually like these long videos, and so I'll do this. I can do more. I have so many more uh, books on uh, human nature. Like even some of the books on language I have discuss human nature. But uh, with that being said, let me know if there's any books that you guys recommend. Uh, some of you have recommended some very, very, very interesting books. Uh, like well, there's one book, uh, Lock of Politics. Someone else recommended a book by Lenin uh, about capitalism and how it leads to imperialism. I just ordered that. That'll be very interesting. Um, yeah, you guys actually have a lot of niche books that are very interesting. So if you have any books in human nature, let me know, and uh, I will look them up and maybe do a review for them. That being said, okay, bye-bye. Tschüss. -bye.